yesterday on the Internet Broke Parenting. We met five sets of parents and their children. Lydia and Derek, Kushbu and Rahul, Pamela and Hong Yi, Michelle and Wei Kang, as well as Roxanne and Sam. They've all had good and bad experiences relying on the internet in their parenting journey. During my first pregnancy, I went to the internet to find the kind of healthy foods that I should be eating. When I was told that your fetus is not growing anymore, that's when my madness of going after the internet became even more targeted. And then it started worsening the situation. It armed us with relevant information, but at the same time, there's so much noise. But the ride has only just begun. As baby gets older, does it get easier? No. Can. Are online resources more useful? Or has the internet broken parenting? One of the hardest things about parenting is that there is never only one right way to do anything. Each child is unique, and every parent has to find their own way. For people who've had multiple pregnancies and multiple children, you know that every pregnancy and every child comes out of the womb. They can be totally different, uh, even twins genetically similar, raised in the same environment, but totally different constitutions and totally different personalities. So trying to take a snippet of somebody else's advice or knowledge and slapping it onto your family, it just doesn't work. Sometimes as a parent, there's a typical uh, regimental approach in few situations that sometimes may not be applicable to that child. End of the day, one size doesn't fit to all. And as the baby grows and develops, there will be more things that parents will have to figure out for themselves. Physical development milestones are something that most parents rejoice over because you can see the progress. So firstly, they start off with the child not being able to leave the head much, only for an instant, then slowly, your little one can hold the neck. He or she will be able to push himself up and look around and then start flipping from front to back and back to front. <laughs> and then subsequently, he or she will be able to start pulling himself or herself up and start standing on his own. Developmental milestones are of course not new. For generations, parents relied on doctors and books to guide them. But today, checklists for these milestones are just a click or tap away. Parents often come worried that their child hasn't reached the milestone that is on the checklist. Like, my child is supposed to turn but he's not turning yet. Or the child is not sitting yet not pulling themselves up yet, but checklists are just for you to take off. For you to be aware that your child can have such development is a guide. It doesn't mean that your child must have this development at this time point. If not, it's a fail. When you Google it up, you look at the milestones of some other's blog post that somebody's kid is doing this and my kid is not doing that. Development is not a quality check. Even the checklist is there, you are not a factory product. No, we are individual. We are supposed to have our individuality as a developmental variation. Which of the following things? Derek was one parent who succumbed to the online pressure. For each milestones, I am quite adamant about getting my son up to speed. To me, that is the goal. 
So I do check every month. For example, like one, two, what should he be able to do? Like raising the head. Okay, good one. I'll read online if I saw the things that we can encourage them to do at home in order to speed up that process. At times, it can be quite anxious, like two months, one day already. Why still cannot? Like two months should be able to do, two months, one day still cannot do the kind of thing. When I've tried out all the information that I got from the internet, it still didn't work. The sense of frustration, yes, a little bit. But on the other hand, I felt that I've given my best shot already. So the rest, I'll just let it develop according to Zane's um, ability. It can get very stressful and pressurizing because he comes to me telling me, why can't Zane do this? I mean, how am I supposed to answer that question? <laughs> Right. I don't have the answer that would actually lead to tension and squabbles between us because he felt like you know I was being too lenient, I felt he was being too strict as well. I think that can be the cons of reading too much and finding out too much from the internet. You end up um, putting a lot of undue pressure on yourself, on your partner and on your kid actually. I don't think, you know, in our previous generation, our parents had that exposure, you know, make sure that we hit every single milestones. It's like after you hit this milestone, there's a next milestone and you end up just keep focusing on the next milestone. Maybe, you know, there was a big milestone that your son had, like being able to stand up and take a few steps. But that appreciation, that gratitude for that feeling was very short-lived. No, I love the car, car. Don't... To me, uh, what Zane can achieve is already something that you want to say job well done and move on. For me, I always look for something that I can do better. Quite yeah, different the way keep, we function. You keep the pressure to yourself, la. don't tell me and him really can. Yeah, so it's quite different. Really. Yeah. <laughs> ah, Roxanne too was affected by the information she found online. We've got a toddler and that's a really exciting time. Mm. It really is. But when it came to the social accounts that I was following, it was all about, my kid is doing this, is your kid doing this? There's a very big comparison. Competition almost. I was viewing a lot of what seemed to me hard to beat expectations. Both our daughters are off the charts when it comes to their height, their weight, all of those things. Good girl. <laughs> <laughs> we make big kids, right? that's the fact. <laughs> but when you're Googling how much should a 12-month-old weigh and your little girl is weighing more than what a boy's average weight is for that age, I was wondering then, as the primary caregiver, as the mother, am I doing enough to make sure that she falls within the average weight range? I actually liked it, where they were like both really flourishing and growing. And everything that I was reading online as well went towards the, it's okay, because the more activities that they're doing, they're just going to grow out of it. So I was, I was fine. I wasn't too concerned. I don't think I would be thinking about it at all, but because I'm proactively searching, is this normal, then I'm getting different answers, then it casts that little bit of doubt in my mind about, okay, am I doing the right thing? And online information got Pamela all worried. Fourth month, she started to crawl, which is a bit odd because when I see online, usually crawling is at least six to eight months. So I was a bit like, eh, why she crawls so fast? Ah? Then we were a bit worried, like, is it she's a bit too active or... At that point of time, we thought it's ADHD, for example. Then we started, like, researching, like, is it there's a possibility of that. I actually didn't really worry because even at four and a half, five months, she had actually tried to sit up. So it's quite early and when I Google the youngest kid that start to crawl. They even give example like baby start to crawl at two months. From that, I know that every baby is special on its own. So I don't really question why she crawls so early or even compared to other babies, is she bigger in size, taller? Because I think that every baby got their own growth chart. If it's aligned with what the national chart that our health booklet gave us, then I think it should be fine. 
My observation is that in this age of so much data availability, we have an overabundance of stimulus and information and that can create a lot more anxieties. And what the doctor gives us are guidelines and ranges. And then we, in theory, should go in peace when the doctor says everything's fine, come back in X number of weeks. But we are now over anxious. We know there's info out there. Let me just figure out if something is going wrong. Maybe I can correct it in time. And so when we Google, we forget that all of these developmental milestones are guidelines. They're not rules. And when we stick too rigidly to any particular thing, that's when we are psychologically most vulnerable to feel stuck, depressed, you know, a host of negative emotions. So when I'm an anxious parent and I push my child to do something and that child is not ready, that child reacts maybe in a cranky, fussy or crying way, that further stimulates my anxiety and then I get even more pushy and then the child reacts even more. So we easily go in vicious cycles. Nobody wants that vicious cycle. But the question is, do parents know when to hit the pause button? Aside from physical development, there is another set of milestones that new parents may be preoccupied with. You can call it emotional and social. Emotional is how you understand yourself and social is how you interact with others. Very first emotional for the baby is the smile <laughs> and the cry. The eye contact at one month becomes a smile by second month. And then that babbling and other things that over the period of time. <laughs> then becomes a word at uh, one year plus. <laughs> one. <laughs> you can have a couple of simple words, Baba, Mama at one year. You can have close to 10 to 20 words by 18 months and you'll have around 50 words by 2 years. There are quite few kids who talk by 2 years. Try But these are just a rough guidelines. These are not absolute to have. Evie. Yeah, Evie. But as with physical development milestones, parents can't help but get overwhelmed by online information around personal social growth. Some parents would worry about it when their kids are not speaking much. Just because the speech is not happening, they get labelled. There's a tendency to come to a different conclusion based on one aspect of their development. It's quite common and that makes a lot of parents worry uh, because when they go on internet and look for the information, the first thing that comes is autism. The diagnosis is by observation of many, many things, not only one thing. So I request parents try not to label things, monitor over the period of time. If they're concerned, you can bring back to the healthcare provider or your doctor. When they come to me, then first assessment starts whether it's just a single milestone delay in terms of the speech, or whether other domains like the gross motor, fine motor skills or social skills are being affected as well. So if everything is going along fine and your child is actually progressing at their own pace, I will start giving them homework to do. Like today, you can teach them these few words and the next time when I see you, we will look at having an X number of words. But I will always remind them to not be too hung out on the exact number that of words they hit, but the whole process of enjoying parenting, sharing different new words and bringing your child to play and learn at the same time. So we don't forget the joy of parenting just to get the number of words in.
Kushbu was one parent who fell into the internet trap. My elder daughter was really early in starting speech. Uh, however, with the second, she up until three, three and a half years wasn't talking much. So a simple search about speech milestone or speech delay would not just get you autism spectrum, the abnormalities or disorders, but it would also give you the opposite, where you would see all those gifted children. Are you contesting? You want to tell me some facts about that? Ellen has all these gifted children who come on her show, talk about science, concepts of physics, all the capitals of all the cities, all the countries in the world. And it's, it's intimidating, of course. I ended up bringing this up with every GP visit that I did. And she said that this is not a problem because she is actually responding to everything she's able to express and understand, although not in full sentences. So I think that I've kind of uh, taken it too far in, in judging that, you know, a, a certain milestone should look a certain way. Lovely. And these? Watermelon. This? Peanut. At a certain point, I was also reflecting and my friend, she could literally tell me that it's not your child who needs an intervention. Probably you may want to look at some intervention because you're over worried. And then circle, smaller circle. And the first thing you should do is stop becoming a Google doctor. Let the internet be in its place and try to use your own brain rather than internet telling you how to behave and how to judge a certain milestone or a criteria. So, Con. Tell it. What's up? What's up? For Roxanne and Sam, the internet was a boon in the form of the videos that helped their little Evie learn. We looked at a lot of sources online from paediatricians, people who worked in partnership with paediatricians and things to help give those milestone cues. So we knew what the benchmark was. And then how we were able to supplement that was by using YouTube as screen time, we decided that we would focus on two or three that were very strong in being able to strengthen that language ability. Dance, Papa, dance. <laughs> oh, no, you don't. And one thing we were quite pleasantly surprised with, but Evie's verging on the above average for the amount of words that she knows at 18 months, which is around 135 words currently. Not that we're counting. I counted every single word and I wrote it down. Blue. Blue. Green. Green. It also gives us the ability to look at what other motor skills that we can help develop. Like, okay, how can we get her to catch a ball? How can we get her to uh, want to read books? How can we get her to play with colouring in? So it's all those little things that we've been able to see as she's developed with her vocabulary that she can say, she goes, book. So what she wants now, she wants to read books with us. So it's nice to have that, that contrast. It's a parenting choice that has worked for Roxanne and Sam. Where's the bubbles? Bubbles, bubbles. Bubbles, bubbles. We'll put the right one, okay? We have to put green here, purple here, yellow here, and red here. Okay. Even as babies age into toddlers and they start to use their voice, they are still not able to express all their big feelings. And that could lead to big meltdowns. Tantrum is a way of expression. So many times, our little ones want to express themselves, but they are not yet at a stage where they can say it verbally, and hence, it results in some frustrations, and they decide to express themselves as a tantrum. And this is very much a very normal part of growing up. But we have to clean our teeth, you know that? Ibu? Hey, 
Okay, so stand properly first. You'll get caught. The core okay. developmental mission of toddlerhood is for the child to develop a sense of self, an awareness that the self is a separate organism from adult caregivers. That they can exert force and influence over the world. So saying no, refusing certain behaviors, no longer following all instructions, these are bravo behaviors. The child is doing exactly what they should be doing at this age because then the child can become an independent person and continue to flourish and grow. That's developmentally normal. Oh, only this much. Okay, done, done, done. Okay, okay. Come. But for any adult who has been around a toddler tantrum, it's not easy to think of it as anything normal. Oi. Leading parents at their wit's end to seek solutions. Rather than sit and be with this difficult emotion, we have the pretense of control. If I just go out and Google something and do something, I might fix it and then this emotion will no longer exist. I think any method that's a one-size-fits-all, you know, anonymous advice given to you without knowing your particular circumstances, your child's particular circumstances, don't work. As a parent, both partners discuss this first. If this happened, what should we do? What should be the response? Have a strategy is ready and you're more prepared to deal with it. And it does get better as time goes by. Always go to a respectable medical website for your information. No blogs, no WhatsApp, no Facebook thing. Because each person has different emotional quotient. What other person can do, you may not be able to do. Michelle experienced exactly that. What she saw working for others online just didn't work for her. I think we started to see the tantrums and the meltdowns increase around 18 months. We did seek out the internet from time to time uh, and there were tips about gentle parenting and how to handle meltdowns and I thought some of them were useful but a lot of them were not. I think when he came to Elliot, he was quite a spirited child. So initially we were quite firm when he had meltdowns and over time we realised that a lot of the methods that we tried weren't really working. Elliot definitely knew who to bully and get his way. So he would bully the helpers first and then the grandparents mommy and daddy. So there's no flow chart to tell you that when your kids have a meltdown, is he doing A, B, Z? If yes, one chart here, if no, another chart there. So we cannot just rely on the internet. So we have to trust our own instincts, our own intuition, and try to guide them along the way when they're having meltdowns or tantrums. We do not enforce timeouts at home. So when he's having a tantrum or an outburst, we try and bring him to a quiet corner in the room. Uh, squat down, be with him on his level and really talk to him, like guide him through his emotions and how he's feeling. I think there's a lot of pressure on us to be the perfect parents, to have perfect children who will behave themselves. If you have part-time or full-time work or if you're a full-time parent, that's also full-time work. So that also means that when our child is throwing a tantrum and that's likely to be loud, we are already under-resourced. <coughs> and on top of that, we have to go manage that. And we may not be able to regulate our own anger and frustration fast enough before we regulate our children. The most commonly reported feeling is feeling incompetent and feeling that they have failed themselves and failed their child because they were not able to engage. There's a lot of self-blame. Okay. It doesn't quite help when sometimes family members might criticise 
their way of parenting even though they're trying their best and that can cause a lot of anger, a lot of guilt, a lot of sadness and sometimes resentment also. Don't be too harsh on yourself. We cannot expect toddlers to behave like adults. When my patients come in with this, one thing I will say to them is that sometimes, right, adults don't even behave like adults. Babies may not behave like adults, but they sure grow fast and start learning new skills and be independent. What was once a helpless newborn is now developing fast, moving on to solids and learning essential skills like feeding themselves. And learning right alongside other parents who need to know how to teach their child. After six months old, when your child has more physical development, so that is the time where you give your child some space to learn how to hold the spoon, hold the food to eat, self-feed thereafter, and also give them some space to learn how to climb chairs in a safe manner. Firstly, self-feeding is a lifelong skill. We need to learn how to feed ourselves in the future. Weaning is an exciting time for parents because finally, they can introduce something else other than milk. So, excited parents will always look around and see what other options. And there, on the internet, they will talk about traditional way of feeding, baby led weaning, and etc. So I think the best way of weaning is the way that fits your child's and your family habits as well as routine. For Lydia and Derek, online resources proved useful, though they were not always on the same page. The internet really helped me when it came to uh, solids preparation and the transition because I was online searching for YouTube recipes, you know, what kind of baby food maker, at what stage and how many days after that you should change the recipes. I enjoyed it actually. I enjoyed the homemade preparation because food and nutrition is what I'm interested in. Because I'm not a food person, so I don't know all these things. And uh, she really did a lot of homework for that case. The internet is very useful. I really appreciated his involvement and, you know, slaving in front of the stove, in the hot, stuffy kitchen, cooking every morning. There was no tension um, between getting the type of food, but there was a very strong contention when it came to the method to execute. So I was very pro baby led weaning. He was very pro spoon feeding. I can't really accept the mess involved or the aftermath of baby led weaning. I didn't take the initiative to do the readings, uh, to do the research on the internet in terms of baby led weaning because I've cooked the food. The nutrients are there. Just deliver it into the tummy. So, spoon or baby led weaning, to me, it goes to the stomach. So in the end, 70% would be spoon feeding and 30% would be baby led weaning. Good. In the case of Michelle and Wei Kang, a baby led weaning method they found online seems to have worked wonders. So we came across the baby led weaning method where we were supposed to expose our kids to many different kinds of foods and a self-teaching method which would purportedly reduce their pickiness and also to enhance their curiosity for food. So it was quite fulfilling actually to see a young boy, you know, seven, eight months old, chowing down on pasta, meatballs, fish, potatoes. Of course, he rejected foods that he didn't like. Like, he didn't particularly like... Cauliflower. Cauliflower or uh, soft foods like mashed potato. You wouldn't chance upon this method without the internet. We follow a popular Instagram account where they would post graphics on 
feeding and age-appropriate food portions to the child and how can we cut or serve the food in an appropriate and safe way for the child at every age. So we rely quite a fair bit on that. For Roxanne, ensuring that her daughter had healthy food became unnecessarily stressful. My idea was, yeah, okay, we can get recipes, but then how do I present them in a way that she's going to want to eat them? So I went on to a lot of the social platforms where I found accounts that were giving video tutorials on how to make really healthy snacks in really fun ways that are digestible for children. For example, you know, celery pieces in the shape of dinosaurs and little panda bento boxes and, and things like that. But a lot of those social media accounts were like super daunting for me. Yeah, I'm more practical. You don't need to reinvent the wheel. If we're eating food, she's going to eat the same things that we're going to be eating because she'd get the blended version of what we were having. Knowing that she's actually getting something that's nutritional for her and that's healthy. So I get a lot of joy out of it. But being able to find other recipes for her that she can grow into, like from giving her a different variety of fruits and vegetables and to extending her palate. The internet is skewed toward visual images, right? So beautiful things get more attention than ugly things and things that can be easily visually captured, you know, get boosted higher in the algorithm of all the social media platforms than things that are maybe described in text. The function ultimately is nourishing your child. And the function is to enjoy your process of motherhood, experience it as positively as you can. So if you're managing to feed your child, they're growing, why do you need to compare and make these beautifully plated meals? Maybe that's not you. Maybe that's somebody else's therapy is to be creative. Um, maybe that's their outlet, but it's not yours. Just because it's out there, doesn't mean you have to do it. Do what's right for you. What goes in must come out. No. Another item on parents' agenda would be potty training. 15, 18 months, some of them are ready to be toilet trained. And there would become a particular behavior pattern around the pooping. Those are the time you start working up for the toilet training. There are a lot of tips on the internet you can pick up. See what you can do. It may take a little while. Some are trained at three years, some are trained at four years. Some are... There's not much of a difference in the IQ if you're trained at four years or four and a half years. So try not to connect everything to the brain development. Toilet training need not to be so stressful. But for Lydia and Derek, it was. For potty training, I took that as my responsibility because she's a boy. So I then went on to the internet to read on how can we encourage him. After so many readings and so many tries, it didn't turn out well. He was quite late in terms of potty training. I actually also read a lot online that potty training is a process but it has to click at the right timing when the muscles are able to coordinate with the brain. And that is something that you can't control and you can't rush. In the end, the whole process took us six months. Every evening, he would <laughs> bring him to stand in front of the urinal and they would just cry. So it became a very traumatizing experience and I had to do damage reversal. Human development is complex, it's not linear. And specifically on potty training, there are cultures or habits that really advocate for potty training early. And then there are other people in societies that are perfectly happy, you know, letting the child stay in night diapers, you know, maybe till primary school, right? There's no one right answer. So I would question, you know, why are you trying to attain a certain goal? Everything that you see shared online, whether it's in text or video or a picture, that is one image, one point in time um, that's been maybe filtered, maybe edited, maybe manufactured, you know, produced to be publicly shareable and likable. Whereas your existence with your child 
is a continuum. You go through the good moments, you go through the bad moments. So don't be fooled. That one moment you see shared online isn't every moment that person is experiencing. There are lots of good moments and likable images to be found on the internet, including many that can make mummies feel inadequate. How did our parents cope with those since the birth of their little ones? Pregnancy, childbirth, parenting. None of these are easy. For the mother, it has an impact on her body image. Some of the physical changes during pregnancy may remain even after you have delivered. Uh, for example, stretch marks. Some women, the stretch marks will be there permanently. Melasma is referring to areas of increased pigmentation where certain parts of the skin become a little bit darker. Sometimes these will fade away completely. Other times there may still be some residual uh, darker colour. Some women complain of hair loss, whether it's during the pregnancy or after the pregnancy has ended. Those are the visible changes. Maybe the bigger issues that are not so visible are around identity. Many mothers, new mothers, come to me and say, you know, while they gained a child, they gained a baby, they really lost a sense of self. And for many mothers, that process of reframing their identity, rebuilding their identity, or getting back to some semblance of their old identity, old self, can be a very long process. The other big psychological factor I think that's ignored is this idea of grief. Maybe you do feel sad and grieve your independence. Maybe you saw yourself as the fun one and now you know, you're the boring mom in your group. There's a certain grief attached to that and we rarely talk about it. And the internet, with its unrealistic images and impossible standards, can make things so much worse. Michelle certainly felt the effects of looking at other people's online perfect moments. What I see on the internet is quite frequently this notion of like bouncing back. And that really impacted my self-esteem to a point where actually my husband told me, you know, you need to stop looking at Instagram because those are not realistic. Uh, and, and it's not an accurate representation of what other people genuinely feel and want to reveal. So over time, I realized that this body actually housed the baby and that there is no truly this sense of bouncing back because the body has went through so much and while it has impacted my self-esteem, I feel that more women need to know that it's okay that you know a couple of kilos have been gained um, here and there. I would say that she wasn't really herself as a new mother. Sometimes I had to get it out of her. How are you feeling? Why are you feeling this way? I think the internet has already harmed or planted very dangerous seeds even before parenthood starts. And then they start romanticizing parenthood, pictures of moms cradling their kids, oh how beautiful this is. But from day one they realized that this could not be further from the truth. So when new moms are struggling to have a positive self-image, the partner can just be their cheerleader. Give them the positive statements about themselves that they can't give to themselves, right? You're doing a good job, you're a great mom, you look great. And the other side of that is when they're feeling really down, the partner's best way to support is actually not to offer a solution. So what we most need is somebody to listen and to affirm, to say, this does sound hard for you. I can see how tired you look. Right? Just listen, just affirm that what your partner is going through is normal, is real, rather than jumping in there and trying to tell them what to do. Supportive fathers are clearly important 
not only to the baby but to the mother. Kushbu's husband Rahul certainly did his part. Both their daughters were born premature. I did my research on how to hold them and all those things, but it was kind of not working. They both were like uh, very light, so I was like not aware how to hold properly and all. I also did quite a lot of research for like how to make them sleep and all. So those, uh, I believe, uh, I, it only works for uh, YouTube. Rather than they falling asleep, I was getting sleepy over there. Okay. He has been convincingly sharing parenting duties, I would say. That, okay, since you fed them, you cleaned them up, let me take the sleeping duty. It takes a lot of learning, a bit of learning and research. It was a very challenging task for me to make them fall asleep. Pamela's husband, Hong Yi, was actively online in his support for his wife. I joined a dad's telegram group when Pamela was pregnant at three months and tried to find out more information from what to expect as a father because the chat only consists of fathers basically based in Singapore. So even like what to prepare on the day of delivery, what to bring, they will actually list out. And if you ask questions, even like insurance, what to get, if the insurance is needed, they will actually help you. Actually, I think it's quite helpful so far. He will see topics where we didn't think of. It's information that we won't know or we... You we can't get through. A loving, supportive partner can make all the difference. And in the bedroom, it's crucial. That grace in putting your wife's needs or your baby's needs above yours will be appreciated. So things not to do would be don't be critical. Uh, don't be harsh, you know, don't kind of uh, guilt trip her into saying but you know, I haven't had sex for so many months but maybe take on a more understanding uh, perspective, a more supportive, a more kind perspective because your wife has just been through a very traumatic process of delivering and bringing a baby out of her body. Mothers out there will recommend uh, stop reading this information online. Your body is your own. You have a right to decide when you are ready to venture uh, to having sexual intimacy all over again. Be kind to yourself uh, and have these open, honest conversations with your partner about when you are ready. And intimacy doesn't necessarily need to be sexual intercourse. It can also come in different forms of intimacy. Roxanne too had an understanding partner in her husband, Sam. Transitioning from wife to mother is a huge step in so many different realms. And when you become a primary caregiver, a lot of your needs are put aside for the benefit of your baby. So being able to communicate with other women online in an anonymous fashion about things like, when did you start having sex again with your husband? Was it painful? Was it more pleasurable? It helped me be able to communicate effectively with Sam about how I was feeling about certain areas. Eventually, when we did move back into an intimate space, it was an enjoyable experience for the both of us. And sure enough, three months later, we were pregnant with Zoe. So it was Something worked. Definitely, definitely worked. <laughs> to be honest, for this, I didn't use the internet at all. I kind of just read the room. You know, make rocks feel sexy again, do some flirting, you know, just, just bring the relationship back to ground zero. And just knowing that I had an open line of communication with my husband was a huge help as well because I understood from a lot of conversations online with, with other women that they didn't have that same level of intimacy, emotional intimacy, let alone physical intimacy with their partners. For most parents, the internet has been a double-edged sword. But if they were to decide between the good and the bad, uh, would they say that the internet has broken parenting? 
No, it hasn't broken parenting. No, definitely not. It hasn't uh, broken the parenting. I would say no. Eh? Mm -hmm. I agree. I think the internet hasn't broken parenting. No, the internet has not broken parenting. I honestly don't think the internet has broken parenting. No. Yes. The internet is what you put in it. And what you get out of it is also up to you. If I have to give a yes or no answer, I'll say yes. <laughs> I am a strong advocate of parenting your child your own way, not how the internet instructs you to do. I think no. No, I don't think the internet has broken parenting. I think we are still learning in the digital age how to use the internet to support our parenting. For me, I don't think there is a yes or no answer. I'm going to sit solidly on the fence. Internet has augmented parenting, provided it used wisely. I don't think that the internet has broken parenting. I think that there are pros to using the internet, but perhaps it's how we are using the information that may have broken parenting.